Um, thank you all for coming. It's my great pleasure to welcome Ron Weiss for our first distinguished lecture series. Uh, Ron is a computer scientist by training. He got his undergraduate studies at Brandeis. Uh, this was followed by a PhD at MIT. And then he spent many years at Princeton as a professor in electrical engineering. And in 2009, he went back to MIT, where he's now a full professor in bioengineering and electrical engineering. So Professor Weiss is a leader in the field of synthetic biology, and he can tell us more about it. But the way I understand it is designing biological circuits inside cells for different applications. For example, you can design circuits that function as logic gates, switches, amplifiers, things that we typically attribute to electronic systems. So for all the students who are here in the audience, I'd like to mention a lot of the initial pioneering work was done by Professor Weiss as a grad student, and that essentially led to this new field of synthetic biology. So talk about putting pressure on our students. That's kind of a high bar. So he's worked in this field for over 20 years, has led to many awards, many seminal contributions, and I'd like to mention a few honors. So he was named the top 100 innovator awards from MIT's Technology Review magazine. Moreover, his research is the top 10 emerging technologies as per the MIT's Technology Reviews. So without further delay, I'd like to invite him on stage and he can take us into the fascinating world of synthetic biology. Great, thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here. It's exciting to be here. I've already had great interactions uh, this morning, this afternoon, hopefully leading to some grant proposals. So looking forward to that. Uh, and William, for the pursuit of science. <laughs> Dollars are just necessary. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm a computer scientist by training. And uh, about 20 years ago, um, while pursuing my PhD, I became fascinated with the notion that we might be able to treat cells as being programmable. Okay, so this notion that we would write some kind of a high level computer program, and then we would use a biocompiler to take that high level computer program and then translate that, or that actually the compiler would do that itself, translate that automatically into some kind of regulatory network. So for example, a genetic circuit that would implement the high level uh, function or program that's specified over here. And then once you, or the biocompiler figures out what that regulatory circuit looks like, you actually synthesize DNA that corresponds to that regulatory circuit. You, know, you put that DNA into the cells, and then the cells do exactly what you wanted them to do. You know, it's, it's kind of nice fantasy to get the cells to do exactly what you want. Uh, turns out to be a little bit more difficult than, uh, I, I figured it was gonna be difficult, but yeah, it's pretty difficult. Uh, uh, but, but it does require um, new approaches. It does require the development of a new engineering discipline with an understanding of what are the rules, what are the mechanisms, um, what are the philo philosophies by which we can actually make this happen, by which we can make this be a predictable, efficient, reliable process. And so to some extent, I think that defines synthetic biology. And so many of us in the field are inspired by uh, other engineering disciplines. So for example, uh, inspired by what happens in uh, either computer engineering, computer science, or robotics. And so this notion that we can take basic devices and put these devices to create uh, basic logic functions, basic operations, and then incorporate them to create more sophisticated modules that have now more sophisticated information processing or decision-making capabilities, and put those modules into uh, entities, such as, let's say, robots or something like that, and then get these entities, possibly autonomous entities, to commun communicate with one another so that they collaborate on particular tasks. And so this is, you know, this is something that's known, this is something that's done in other engineering disciplines and works out quite well. And so the question here is, can we do something similar in the world of biology? So can we start with proteins, genes, and connect them to create basic, basic biochemical reactions that perform basic logic operations, basic control operations, uh, create from those customized pathways that have more complex information processing and control capabilities, 
take those, embed those into the cells, and then get the cells to coordinate the behavior so that we can have programmable uh, cultures of bacteria or programmable tissues. And so we spend a lot of time in the field uh, trying to understand how to take what's known in other engineering disciplines and then apply that to the world of biology. Uh, and I think uh, we spend a lot of time, you know, 10, 15 years with a, with a real focus on that. I would say as we've gotten, you know, we've been able to get some progress, make some things work, we've also gotten, certainly I have as I've aged and so on, gotten to appreciate biology a little bit more and respect it maybe a little as I'm losing hair and so on and getting more gray hair, to respect uh, what biology has to do and the complexity of biology. And so also now uh, engaging in some major efforts to understand how biology is different as a substrate for programming than any other existing engineering discipline. And so kind of to think about that, uh, you know, as a young scientist, this is the way I, I envision the cell, this nice modular entity that we can program uh, reliably and predictably. Um, and a few years ago when I, I was in a cab ride with Michael Elowitz, one of my colleagues, he liked to think of cells as slightly different. Um, so, you know, it depends on your perspective, on you know, how optimistic you are, or how naive you are, and so on. Um, I would say in, the, in this spectrum, you know, I started more over here. I'm not quite to this level. I would say I'm probably one-third of the way over here. I'm still m more biased towards this philosophy or this perspective, but uh, certainly trying to understand ways by which we can incorporate systems biology into synthetic biology in order to make this uh, a more reliable, more predictive uh, engineering discipline. And so when we think about programming the cells, we oftentimes use this analogy uh, where we take DNA and we embed the DNA into the cells and then this DNA encodes a genetic program that oftentimes consists of three main elements. Okay, so this genetic program will often consist of uh, elements that are able to sense what's going on inside the cell uh, or sense what's going on outside the cell and then transmit that sensory information into essentially some kind of a biocomputer, so a genetically encoded biocomputer, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll show you many examples of that. And then this, uh, this core right here, based on the sensory information of what it's sensing right now or what it's sensed in the past, will be able to make certain decisions about what to actuate, okay? And so this actuation would be uh, some, something that controls the output. It could be something that controls what's going on inside the cell or something that controls what's taking place outside the cell. And so this notion of sensing, processing, and actuation is something that we, we use quite often, almost all the time, in the creation of our engineered systems. And I, again, I think this has been a very useful way uh, to get many of these projects actually implemented and functional. Uh, but as, as we've grown and as we've kind of um, I think in the field gotten more sophisticated, we've also started to uh, focus on other aspects of, of the field. Okay, so for example, the notion of rules of composition. So is it true in biology that one plus one really equals to two? Okay, so that's not something that, that's so obvious, not something that's so clear. I'm, I'll actually touch upon that uh, a little bit during this talk. Uh, noise, how does gene expression noise, for example, play a role in the behavior of our systems? cellular context. So when I drew this diagram over here, I didn't really discuss what the cell type is. But obviously the cell type is going to have a significant impact on the behavior of the system. Uh, even if it's a, let's say, stem cell that differentiates over time, that, that differentiation over time will have a potentially significant impact on the operation of the circuit. And that's not something we have still great ways to think about in terms of how we engineer our systems and how we predict the, the behavior that we would expect to get. Other things that are unique, persistence, mutations happen all the time, cell death, and, and we certainly want to do this in a context where we don't understand everything. We don't necessarily understand all the interactions that take place inside the cell. We don't want to wait until that's known before we begin to engineer the cells. You know, certainly will be much after, you know, I die, so I'd rather work on this now uh, before that happens. So, uh, so understanding how to engineer things reliably when there's incomplete information presents its own set of challenges and, and possibly its own set of mechanisms that, that will be able to function well in that context. 
Why do we want to program the cells? So it's not so we can make you know, faster iPads or iPhones or anything like that uh, that are run by, by bacterial cells. It's really about uh, the various kinds of applications that we have in mind, whether it's uh, biochemical synthesis, so for synthesizing various kind of antibiotics or other kinds of compounds that can help, uh, clean energy, bioenergy is a, another big one, environmental applications, sensing or remediating the environment. Uh, what we work on uh, in my lab, what we focus on a lot more is the notion of biomedical applications. So can we genetically uh, program human cells to address various kinds of diseases? Okay, and so I'll give you a couple of examples uh, towards the latter portion of, of this talk. And so in terms of kind of the overall workflow, we start with software that allows us to design these biological circuits. We think about what parts are available. We think about how to uh, deliver these genetic payloads into the cells. Um, and then we think about how do, you, how do you create functional circuits in this biological context? Can we predict what happens? Can we have things that are actually modular? So I'm gonna uh, talk about pr uh, predictions. I'm, I'm gonna talk about being able to create modularity. Um, and then I'll end by talking about uh, a couple of example applications where we think this notion of programming cells somehow fundamentally changes the way you address these specific areas. And I'll talk about uh, cancer as one uh, example application and then uh, this notion of organs on the chip. Okay, so, so if you care more about the applications, you know, stick around, we're gonna uh, talk a lot about the foundational aspects, really trying to understand how to make things uh, predictable, how to make things uh, more modular. So I'll spend a significant amount of time on that. And then uh, how that helps in terms of going for these, uh, for these kinds of applications, okay? And then one of the things that remains a challenge, and, and that's, a, that's an unsolved, so if you're looking for PhD uh, topics, uh, how do the applications then actually uh, change the way you design these biological circuits. So I think with respect to kind of closing the circle, uh, it's not there yet. I mean, I think it's, a, it's an area of possibly very exciting research, okay? So we start with parts. So we just about uh, always think, you know, that we have a collection of parts that might be available to us, okay? So we have high-level behavior, and then you think about what parts might be useful to create that high-level behavior. And so they involve regulation. Uh, that's probably where we spend most of our efforts. So I'll show you things like this where we have transcriptional regulation and we would think about that in terms of the logic function that it actually implements. And we do not just transcriptional, we do translational, we do uh, interactions at a protein, protein level, okay? So this is one of the main sources for, for parts. Cell-cell communication is another kind of part. So we not only wanna engineer individual cells to do something, but engineer cell-cell interactions. We wanna see what's going on in the cell. So we'll have reporter parts that uh, either make colors or fluoresce in different, uh, different uh, colors and then interfacing with a cell. So we actually found out you guys are working on Holin. I, I forgot to actually have that on my slides over here. Um, so uh, parts that help us interact with a cell. So one of the things that uh, graduate students like to do is figure out ways to kill the cell in interesting ways. Um, or, or sense, what's, or maybe yeah, undergrads do that even more. Um, and it could be useful. So how do you sense what's going on in the cell and how do you affect the actual cell itself? And so, th so the fundamental question, um, and I would say this is either the biggest, you can think about this as either the biggest challenge or even the definition of synthetic biology is how do you create functional systems out of these parts? Okay, that, that is the challenge. So let's go back to so uh, take a, a trip in time. So this is, goes back all the way to my PhD. This is in the late 90s when I was working on my PhD and I was trying to understand you know, how, how this notion of parts to system. So first of all, what are the parts that are available to us? Okay, so I defined to begin with a couple of parts. One of them is a part that allows us to implement the, uh, okay, so we have computer failure over here. I don't know if there's a uh, maybe, oh, here we go, debugged, that was interesting. Uh, see, useful to have a PhD in computer science, right? Uh, so this is the not operation, okay? So we have one input, one output, and the, bas the basic question is, how do we implement the not operation in biology? And so what I said is, let's use transcriptional repressors. So I, I didn't invent transcriptional repressors. 
But the question was, can I take transcriptional repressors and engineer them to uh, perform the NOT operation in a way that I can then use to build uh, actual systems out of it? So the way it works is that uh, if the repressor input is not there, then we have expression of the output protein. So I have a mapping from zero on the input to one on the output where protein concentrations represent the signal, the, the lows and the highs. And then if you have a high level of the repressor in the system, it binds to the promoter region and represses the production of the output protein. So this is basically executing the NOT operation, at least you know, in a PowerPoint presentation. Right? And so then, we ask, uh, then I ask the question, what else can we build on top of that? So this is another gate that I defined in, my, in my, my PhD. Again, taking known operations and asking what kind of logic function do they implement. And so now we have the repressor as before, and we also have a small molecule inducer. So if the repressor is there, there's no output protein. But if the repressor is there and we add an inducer, it inactivates the repressor and allows expression of the output protein. So now this is uh, executing the not repressor or inducer logic function. So this is implementing what's called the implies logic function. You know, you can't go to Radio Shack and buy a lot of implies logic gates. Uh, but it is a useful function in terms of uh, allowing me to interface with a cell. So the more inducer that I add, the more gene expression I can get. Okay? And so then I said, Let, let's build a circuit out of these components. And so the specific function uh, is, so it's an ultra-sensitive switch. Um, and the idea is that yellow fluorescent protein is the not-not of the small molecule inducer ATC. Okay, so that's asking the question, can we take these noisy biological components and put them together to create reliable digital behavior, which is, wasn't so obvious at the time. Okay, so we have, so, so that's a reason we want to do the not-not operation. Not-not seems kind of silly operation, but it's asking the question is, does it get worse as a cascade of knots gets longer or does it actually get better? Okay, so we put those repressors in a cascade like this and we made observations and you see the blue is the first stage, the black is the second stage, and this yellow orange is the last stage. And the cool thing about this is that the uh, input output response gets more digital as the system gets more complex. So we got excited about that and that gave us hope that we can actually build reliable digital behavior in living cells. So I want to point out it's not just about digital behavior, so we're able to create also um, analog behavior that has timing to it that we can actually regulate. So here we build cell-cell communication. And so I'm going, going over this quickly. So we built a mechanism by which we can induce cells to send a molecule over to the receiver cells. And the receiver cells had this feed-forward motif that they activated a green fluorescent protein first, and then they activated a repressor that repressed the green fluorescent protein. And with this feed mo for motif, the idea is the cells communicate, and then GFP goes up and then goes down. Okay? And so we're able to engineer using computational models the timing and the amplitude properties of this. And so it's important, again, to, to mention that we have both digital and analog uh, and transient behavior that we can regulate. Uh, and the other aspect is also regulating multicellular behavior. So we took these communicating cells and we created a, a, a more complex feed-forward motif. And now the cells uh, are able to respond to intermediate concentration of the cell-cell communication, and they do not respond to high or low levels. So now they have this non-monotonic low-high-low response to the cell-cell communication signal. And we use that, we tied in, uh, wired in different fluorescent protein outputs and put cells in a petri dish that are undifferentiated, put senders in, uh, in different places. And what you're seeing here is experimental results with uh, genetically engineered bacteria. They were able to create a variety of different patterns based on the cell-cell communication and the genetic programs um, that, we, that we're able to engineer, okay? So I don't know if this is too useful to create bacterial patterns, uh, but, you know, we still got money for it. Um, but what we're trying to do now, and that's the last thing I'm going to discuss today, um, is engineer these mechanisms uh, in stem cells, human stem cells, and the question is, can we create tissues by design using these kinds of mechanisms? So create uh, patterns, and then use those patterns as a mechanism to regulate the differentiation of the stem cells. Okay, so we're beginning to take some baby steps uh, towards that goal. Now, 
um, in this process, we also learn that computational design tools are, are essential. So we can design something like this, we can look at it, we can use intuition, but as the systems get more complex, intuition doesn't work any, anymore. Okay, and so we, we really think that computational design is going to be absolutely required to scale up the field and be able to engineer more and more complex behavior. And so I teamed up with one of my uh, former graduate uh, student colleagues, Jake Beal and uh, Doug Densmore at BU. And so the notion here is that we're creating this uh, biocompiler platform where we start with some high level description and then the biocompiler takes, takes you down from the high level description to abstract gene networks, to an actual DNA sequence, to something that you can then put into the cells. So we want to be able to automate that process. Okay? And so if you're interested, uh, you can go to this website, synbiotools.bbn.com, uh, um, and then get a free uh, registration there, and then you can write programs. And then what this tool does, it creates MATLAB simulation, so genetic networks, which then MATLAB, you get MATLAB simulations over. You can see whether they, they begin to make sense. Ultimately, we'd like to also give you the DNA so that you come up with a high-level program, we give you the DNA. Not quite there yet, uh, but I think we're getting closer. And so this notion is that we write high-level programs, and so I apologize for all these parentheses over here. This is because I uh, studied Lisp uh, as a graduate student, and so, and Jake Beal did too, and so we kind of got stuck. I think it was a terrible decision to actually do this as the interface. Uh, we thought this was a cool language, didn't realize we're too much of computer nerds and that people won't necessarily be that excited about uh, parentheses. But, uh, so this is a simple program. This says if the input is high, produce a cyan fluorescent protein, else produce a yellow fluorescent protein. Okay, and I'll actually, the next slide, I'll step you through that uh, in a little bit uh, more detail. And so the biocompiler takes that, makes a data flow automatically. From the data flow, it makes an abstract gene regulatory network. From that, it figures out an actual genetic sequence uh, that, that corresponds to that. It creates robot assembly instructions. We have a robot in the lab that uh, actually is able to perform about 90% of the operations. So you can actually uh, then perform much of the uh, things that you normally do manually. Uh, the robot right now sits there and collects dust. Uh, we realized that if we ran this, you know, in probably about a week or so, we would bankrupt my lab. So we're not really running that anymore. But one thing we have done is we, and this is with PCAR Lincoln Labs, we are working on miniaturization. And so the idea is that we want to use microfluidics to be able to do DNA assembly. And in fact, we've been able to demonstrate that all the new DNA assembly technologies we can now do with microfluidics. This would be a $3,000 device that we can actually put on everybody's bench. And so you would come up with a high level program and then you have on your bench a microfluidic device that actually builds for you Maybe not just one genetic circuit, maybe you know, 256 genetic circuits at a time to figure out which ones of them are actually gonna work. And that's not that far away. Okay, that kind of, that, that's gonna be reality um, within a few years. I mean, we're talking maybe one, two, three years, we're gonna possibly have this uh, available you know, to more and more labs, okay? And so, uh, what does the compiler do? So let me step you through this. So, so you, you write this high-level program. The way you read Lisp is from the inside out. So you're going to read IPTG sensor. So you sense IPTG. You do the not operation, and then you fluoresce in green. So it means fluoresce in green if not IPTG. And so that gets translated to an IPTG sensor where the data flows to a not operation and then flows to something that makes a green fluorescent protein. So the biocompiler can do that to the high-level code that you write. And then the biocompiler says, oh, how do I make an IPTG sensor in DNA? Well, it's this motif right here. So promoter regulates the production of LAC-I, a, a repressor, which represses the production from, a, from the LAC promoter, okay? And then you can add IPTG, and when you add IPTG to the system, you get more expression from this promoter. Okay, so that's your IPTG sensor. The not operation, so I showed you the not operation, it's simply a repressor to a particular promoter. Uh, make green, so you have an activator. So you have activator activating the green fluorescent protein. So the nice thing from that data flow, it's pretty easy to translate that to small motifs that implement each one of these boxes. And then the question is, how do you connect all of those uh, motifs? 
And so the way you do that is with these transcription factors. So A is a, is a repressor, B is an activator. You put those in there, you glue these motifs together, and there you go. So automatically, the biocompiler goes from this to something that looks like this. Okay, and that's a genetic circuit that you can start thinking about, oh, I'm actually gonna build this in the lab. Okay, and then uh, it actually goes, can go through optimizations. Maybe I'll, you know, just very quickly, just say that you can take something like this, and then the biocompiler has a set of rules where it can optimize, for example, the, uh, the activator away from this. Okay, so I'm not gonna go into the details of the optimization, but I'll show you that when you have even a more complex program like this, it will start from something very, uh, you know, hairy, a genetic circuit that's very hairy, and the, and the compiler that does a series of optimizations, and it ends up uh, creating something that from 15 transcription units, it, it goes to five. So that's something that, you know, begins to matter. So you can imagine this workflow where you're starting with, you know, um, these complex programs, it creates a complex gene circuit, figures out how to optimize it, then uh, creates, let's say, uh, five, uh, oh, sorry, small transcription based circuits, and then you'll say, okay, let me make 256 versions of those to figure out which one of them actually uh, works as desired. Because that's kind of work, workflow that we have in mind. Now, uh, the compiler can do combinatorial logic, like and or not operations, it can do memory, and it can, uh, some version of that can also do spatial features as well, okay? And so that's the biocompiler that's hoped to help you with the initial design. Now, if you just had a biocompiler, you know, maybe it wouldn't be that interesting, okay? So let's, let's begin to talk about the actual, you know, experimental portion. So, so first of all, can we accurately predict what would happen, right? So if I have parts and I have a biocompiler, but then the biocompiler can't really predict what happens, then it's not quite as useful, okay? And so in order to be able to do that, we first of all need parts. And that used to be a huge problem in synthetic biology. For the longest time, for more than 10 years, we mostly had three parts available to us, lac repressor, lambda repressor, and the tet repressor in bacteria, okay? That's what, in, and so people basically figure out how to connect them in all different ways and then kind of ran out of ideas. So there's only so much you can do with three, right? Um, and so kind of things stalled a little bit. But now, so that, that was a major problem. But uh, as of the last even couple of years or so, there's been the ability to create large libraries. And so I'll show you three projects very br briefly. I'm not gonna talk about the details. One project where we took known uh, bacterial promoters and, and repressors and were able to transfer them to mammalian cells. So we made, this is with Chris Boyd, a library of 12 of them that work quite well. We took TALS, so uh, several years ago, TALS were the hottest thing. And so we worked on the creation of a library of TAL repressors. And the nice thing about TALS is that these modular protein that you can basically say, I wanna target this particular DNA sequence and you can create a protein that targets that particular sequence. And so we were able to show that we can create large libraries of tau repressors. And essentially we can make as many as we want, never essentially run out. Um, but then the most recent thing is the Cas9. So if you, you know, synthetic biology and you wanna consider yourself cool and everything, you know, you have to use Cas9. And so we are able to demonstrate uh, recently that we can create Cas9 devices, repressors, that are based on uh, the Cas9 protein and also guide RNA, and the guide RNA allows us to target any DNA sequence that we want. So again, endless number of parts. And we're able to show that we can create a library of Cas9 repressors and with guide RNAs and be able to put them into circuits. Okay, so, so the notion of having enough parts is, is, almost, you know, is almost a solved problem. Not completely, but almost a solved problem. Okay, but then if you have parts, like a repressor, repressing an output, can you do anything with that? Can you, can you predict what happens when I, when I have one repressor and another repressor? Kind of one plus one, does it equal to two? And so the idea is that one part, one repressor would have an input output function like this, an inverse sigmoidal, right? So the more the input you have, the less output you have. So it's acting as a not gate. And so the question is, if you take two not gates like this, can you then, two inverse sigmoidals, can you make a sigmoidal like this? 
And can you predict this? And this is going back to my PhD. This is something I was interested in. And almost 20 years kind of working on it didn't work for a variety of reasons. I tried all kinds of different things, kind of gave up on it for you know, six, seven years. Uh, tried it in bacteria. Just did, it just didn't give us the, the predictions that we wanted. And I said, well, you know, it didn't work in bacteria. Let me uh, try this in mammalian cells to make my life even more difficult um, and see if I can, I can actually make it function. Uh, so this is work uh, Noah Davidson's PhD. And so this is what we did. And we created this mechanism to characterize the repressor. Okay? So this is the repressor, and this is the output. And the idea is that we add small molecule docs, and we, see, we get more repressor. And, and also more blue. So the more docs, we get more blue, more repressor, and less yellow. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. And then we uh, ask the question, so if we put a constitutive fluorescent protein in there, then, and, and we, put, we put DNA into mammalian cells, what happens? Okay, even at the basic level of you have a constitutive fluorescent protein. So this is what we saw. So you know, as I mentioned, making our lives more difficult in this uh, bacterial population, you see huge diversity in the level of red. So this is the level of red, and this is the frequency. So some cells don't have any red, and, and some cells have more and more red. And so the question is, how could you possibly predict what happens in a circuit if you even can't predict you know, what happens in any individual cell because they have such huge variety? And so there's no way to predict what happens across the entire population. So let's at least figure out what happens to a subsection of the population where the level of red is going to be a proxy for the amount of DNA that entered the cell. Okay, so if a lot of DNA entered the cell, we would have a lot of red, and that means that there's a lot of copies of the circuit, and if only a little bit of red uh, is being observed, that means there's very little DNA in the cell. Okay, and so we basically bind the cells based on the fluorescence and then ask the question, what's the relationship between input and output by looking at subpopulations? Okay, and so this is what it looks like. So this is an input versus output. So you're used to seeing transfer curves, you know, the nice and, you know, single line. And we said, no, no, you can't, you can't use that. So you really have to look at the subpopulation. Each one of those lines represents a subpopulation based on the amount of DNA that's there. It's a huge diversity across the population. And we, this is for one of our repressors. This is for another one of our repressors. Okay? But this is now, this is now we believe, useful information to look at the input-output function of each one of the repressors to try to predict what happens. Okay? And so, so again, the notion is that we predict or, or we observe the behavior of one repressor, another repressor, can we predict the overall behavior of the, of the cascade of repressors? Okay? And so we built this particular system where we have repressor one repressing repressor two, when, and then yellow fluorescent protein, and we said the model is actually not based on this steady state dosage response curve, but really a model where uh, we look at the production and the decay for each one of these uh, not gates, each one of these repressor devices. Okay, so we built a model, and it's also based on the timing, it's also based on the dosage of the DNA. So we have a model one device, we have a model of a second device, we put them together. Um, we, this is, it's a little bit hard to see that, but this is the production function, how much is being produced by the device is based on the observations directly. And what we've used to do is say, here are the observations, now let's cre create a nice computational model of the system, okay? Because, you know, that's what we ultimately like to do. But we said, you know, those computational models end up always being wrong for some reason or not. Let's just respect the data. This is our data. This is, we're going to use the data in our uh, computational simulations and predictions. So we use the data that we observe without trying to understand why. You know, why are we seeing that exact curve? We respect the cell. The cell is doing it for some reason. That's what we're going to do, as opposed to try to come up with some elegant, uh, you know, uh, formulation of the of the bio biology underneath. 
And indeed, when we did that, this is now the input, repressor, repressor, output, and these are now the input, output, observations versus predictions, and so the predictions are these circles over here, and the observations are the crosses, and you see they were almost dead on in terms of the predictions within the subpopulation of the input-output behavior, okay? And so this is input-output, this is input-output, and here the mean prediction error is only 20%. Okay, so in biology, usually when you're, you know, three to five fold off, everybody's pretty happy, you know. But here, wherever you, within the subpopulations, get 20% off. Okay, so we're really excited about being able to do this. This is one where we did it with, you know, this is 1.3. We ended up, the average was uh, about 40% uh, off for many, uh, for the circuits that we built. And then we also quantified, uh, without getting into the details, why, wh where we were getting the, the accuracy from. Okay, so now if you have the ability to do predictions at the 20% level, I think you can really begin to use that uh, in terms of designing it and trying to think about what happens. Okay, and also we were able to do this not just for cascades, but also for feed forward loops and getting uh, similar kinds of accuracies. Okay, so we, we have these detailed models of the genetic devices that include steady state dynamics and per plasmid, this is per DNA expression, and now we were able to do highly accurate predictions at least for the kinds of circuits that I was mentioning here. Okay. Um, let me, so um, this is another issue in terms of, of being able to uh, predict what happens. Okay. So modularity. Is modularity an inherent function in biology? It's actually not. Not, not shocking to at least, you know, people that are studying biology here. Uh, so for example, if we put these uh, functional modules in there, there really are uh, non-modular aspects. I'll, gi I'll give you a couple of examples, okay? So if you have one module in biology that is connected to a second module, it's nice to draw these arrows in terms of information flow, upstream, downstream, good. You know, but in reality, this module actually uh, consume, you know, it, it may affect the behavior of the downstream, may affect the uh, behavior of the upstream. It can titrate away resources and so on, so on. That's the reality. It can titrate that away because it's using proteins that are me being made by the, the high-level module. Because of that, that's known as retroactivity. This is work with Damatilla Del Vecchio. Um, and then another one would be that these two modules actually end up using the same cellular resources. So there could be some indirect ways by which they affect one another. And we showed recently with, with Damatilla on how to understand that. Okay, the, the understand these um, subtle couplings. Right, so this is trying to get away from kind of a more naive notion of biology. And so this, uh, by the way, this notion of retroactivity, the notion that uh, a downstream module can actually place load on an upstream module is known. I mean, that we have that when we have electric circuits, electronic circuits that have high fan outs. Right? And so what you do is you create these buffer gates, for example, these amplifiers to deal with this, and so can we create something similar in biology that deal with high fan out? Okay, so let me show you how, uh, so we're able, so this is a simulation where you have an oscillator, so repressor and activator, and so the oscillator, this simulation, works beautifully by itself. So you can get cells that uh, oscillate green on and off. Oh, great. But then as soon as you wanna connect that oscillator to something, like a load, then that load begins to take away from the oscillator. And this is, these are simulations showing that the oscillator basically can be destroyed. Right, so if you wanted to do anything useful with that clock, it, go, you know, it gets destroyed. And um, so without, so this happens in many other systems. I think for the sake of time, you'll just take my word. This is not just unique to clocks. This is many other situations where high fan out is a problem, okay? And so, we wanted to understand, does it experimentally happen? Where load creates a problem. And so here's a relatively simple system where we have an input, it activates expression of this uh, transcription factor, which then results in green fluorescent protein, and then we have a load that competes with this uh, activation of, of green. And so with or without the load, so without the load, this is the, the, blue, uh, the black response over here. So over time, 
the fluorescence goes up, we add load and we see that there's a slowdown, a significant slowdown in the response of the system. And that whether you go up or you go down, there's a slowdown, okay, because of the load. Now the, the interesting thing is that the steady state level actually doesn't change because of the load, just the dynamics of the system. So the, the steady state input output behavior is actually the same, which, is, which was a, you know, quite interesting. Now what does that allow you to do? So uh, to fix the problem, we inserted what's called a load driver, okay? And so at a high level, what this is doing is this is a fast cascade of phosphorylation. So you activate this, trans uh, this uh, protein right here, and then it transmits very quickly the, the phosphate groups over here, and then activates expression of GFP right here. So we essentially took the system, we, uh, we you know, disconnected the, directly the input to the output, and we put a cascade between them. So the thing, the thing is, the, we made the, the cascade such that the system is actually longer in order to fix the, pr uh, the problem that's it's slower, which is kind of odd, right? So we made, in the critical path, we added something to make it faster, okay? But now, why, why does that work? So, so the slow driver is very fast. It's phosphorylation based. So whenever you have load in the system, it can react to it very quickly, right? And go to the same steady state very quickly because it's all based on protein-protein interaction. So it's very fast. And it has transcription on the outside that's very slow, okay? So it's, it's this notion of time scale separation. So to fix the problem, we put in a fast module in between slow modules. And we actually think, we haven't seen anything about this in biology, but we think this might be actually a recurring motif in biology. We start to figure out, you know, does, does nature actually use this mechanism to fix problems too, okay? But before, you know, caring about nature, we care about did we fix our own problems? Um, and so this is what I showed you before, the uh, step up, step, step down, we have problems. And then when we put the fast load driver in there, it fixes the problem, okay? So basically, whether or not you have the load, it doesn't matter, the system works as before and is not slowed down. Okay, so, so putting something in the critical path caused the system to actually respond faster. Okay. And then we're, um, so we create a computational model. We ask the question, what happens when you have uh, different like input intervals? So if you put the input in different periods and frequencies, what happens? And so this computational is showing us that you, know, you can run into problems and then you put the load driver in, in there and it can fix the problem. And so that we use that computational model to guide our experiments. And so this is now showing that when we have periodic input, we get serious problems uh, due to the load. So black is without the load, red is with the load. So it basically destroys the response of the system. And then we put the load driver in there as it completely fixes it. Okay, so we see that it's able to faithfully uh, respond regardless of the load. And then we can look at input frequency, versus amplitude response, and, and again, the load driver fixes it. And so now, uh, so high load breaks the circuit modularity, and we came up with a mechanism, the load driver, that uses, again, we think is an important concept, time scale separation, to minimize the, the problem of the load. And now the hope is that we can get modularity in this, in this biological context using the, these kinds of mechanisms. So hopefully leading to more predictable circuit design. Okay, so now let's me, let me uh, shift to a couple of applications quickly. So if we can predict circuit behavior reliably, how can that help? Okay, and so one of the applications I think is, is cancer. Um, and so uh, briefly in cancer, uh, I would argue th and, and that uh, specificity is one of the more important problems. Okay, so this notion that you have a therapeutic agent that tries to recognize some kind of cell surface marker and then kill the cell, oftentimes results in um, false positives and false negatives. You know, just looking at a single marker on the cell usually will, will not work. And so, so even looking at things like 
you know, the current cancer immunotherapy approaches where you're, you know, recruiting T cells and getting the, to, to recognize something on the cell surface has resulted in serious um, problems with like, in, you know, inflammation, cytokine inflammations and, and so on uh, that ended up killing cells, the, the wrong cells, and actually oftentimes actually result in patient death, okay? And so the issue is that, that oftentimes looking at a single biomarker, if not all the time, is not sufficient. And so what I would argue is that you really need to put the uh, therapeutic agent inside the cell and have it perform logic, logic functions inside the cell, and then be able to give you a very precise determination, is this cancer or not cancer, by looking at multiple biomarkers. And, and I would argue, you know, even if this is not the cure for cancer, uh, there are many applications where multi-input multi logic functions can really help in biology, okay? And you can probably use your imagination for that. I think almost anything in biology can, can benefit from that, uh, from being able to get real-time sensory information from cells. And so what are the sensors? MicroRNA is the one that we're using here. And so the idea is that we have blue, we put into cells blue, uh, something that makes a constitutive blue, and something that makes a red, MK, that has a microRNA target. And so the idea is that uh, we built 620 different microRNA sensors. And when we look at data, so whenever we have the control, blue is the same as red. So basically when there's no microRNA in the cell, blue is the same as red, and so you'll see this distribution based on how, much of the how many uh, copies of the sensor are present. Uh, so that's the control, and then when you have high levels of microRNA activity, the red gets knocked down, and then blue remains high. Okay, so that allows us to then compute the repression in the cells due to the microRNA that is present in the cells. So we have a sensor, a genetically encoded sensor, to the endogenous microRNA level. And so I like to show this. Anybody want a microRNA that's not present there? I, like, I don't know. I, I like to show this because there's a lot. <laughs> okay. The, I feel, you know, sympathy for uh, Jeremy, the graduate student who did this. Um, and so if you look at the data, looking at he, uh, HeLa cancer cells versus HEC-293, human embryonic kidney cells, you see that uh, microRNAs, different microRNAs have different kinds of repression folds. So you can say, if I want to distinguish between HeLa and HEC cells, all I have to do is, you know, take this one or this one. One microRNA might be able to do the trick. But if I wanted to distinguish HeLa cancer cells from all other cell types, you can't find an individual microRNA that will do the trick. You really have to look at multiple microRNAs. And so to do that, uh, we created a six input logic function. And the input logic function is the following. So uh, microRNA, this microRNA, 141, 142, 146, have to be low. One, uh, microRNA 21 has to be high. And microRNA 17 or microRNA 38 also has to be high. So this is a six input uh, logic function. And the idea is that if this is true, that's a HeLa cell and no other cell type. And I would argue that you can essentially do that for any cell, any cell type that you want. You can develop a multi-input logic function that will be very specific, and that will only turn on in that particular cell type. Okay? And then the idea is that if that's the answer is yes, then kill the cell. Okay, so that, that's basically saying microRNA is low, these microRNAs have to be high. So how does that work? So these microRNAs have to be low, and the way you do that, not too bad. So you have the output in uh, the microRNA target sites. So uh, microRNA 141, 142, 146, if any one of those is high, then there's no output. So the only way that the output can be high is, is if this is low, and this is low, and this is low. So you have a three input and gates of not gates, okay? And now you can add to that by having microRNA 21 repress a repressor. So remember I showed you the not not operation? So this not not operation, not not operation is actually really useful here. So that allows us to have microRNA that represses a repressor that represses the final output. Now we have a four input and gate such that the only time that this is high is when these are low and this is high, because that, that's necessary to repress the repressor. And then we can add to that more right over here. And so now either MIR-17 or MIR-38 have to be high to repress this repressor. 
So that's, that's the full logic circuit. And then we put that into cells in a Petri dish, and indeed, they, uh, HeLa cells were the only ones that fluoresced high in green, and then we're a also able to uh, selectively kill the HeLa cells versus other cell types, okay? So we published on that. Uh, even against the worst behaving cells, the HEC293 cells, we got selective killing from them. Okay, and so now we're beginning to explore a mouse model. So this is basically looking, this is uh, looking, let's focus on here. So we have uh, uh, breast cancer uh, as a mouse model and, um, and also melanoma. And so the idea is that this is breast cancer in particular here. And so we can follow over days the size of the tumor. Okay, so it goes up. And we can visualize that because the tumor bioluminesces. And then uh, we deliver uh, circuits into the, into the mouse. And the idea is that the circuits are supposed to detect, first of all, if, if, if they entered a cancer cell or not, and then either kill the cell or actually recruit the immune system to kill that cell and, and similar cells. Okay, so that's the thing we're trying to do right now. We don't quite have the full circuit in there. We're hoping to get that within maybe even a couple of weeks. But even when we put in something very simple, which is just to turn on um, cytokines, such as IL-15, then we are able to observe in the melanoma and also in the breast cancer uh, a significant difference versus the negative control. The tumor was still growing. And even, like, this is not even a real program. It's able to retard the tumor growth. Okay, so just to show you that, you know, we're beginning to do some things in vivo, and now we're hoping to actually put in a multi-step cancer immunotherapy program that would be figuring out where the, where the tumor cells are and then activating the immune response specifically there and then killing the cells as needed. Okay, so that's what we're hoping to do. Um, so, again, we haven't cured cancer yet, you know, but we're, we're taking some steps, I think, in an interesting direction. And then cell type identification is another area where we can use these microRNA sensors. And so maybe, um, how am I doing on time here? Is it? Five minutes? Okay, great. So I'll, I'll briefly talk about the last project, uh, which is organoids. So this is something I've, I showed you the, the patterns before. So this is one of the things that have been interesting from the beginning, is can I uh, program stem cells to differentiate into any kind of tissue I want? or any kind of organoid, you know, organ that I want. And so start with iPS cells or embryonic stem cells or, uh, and then program them to differentiate, to make patterns, and then can we initially create an organ on a chip, okay, on a microfluidic chip by design. And so the uh, possible applications are, can we use that for drug development? So specifically we created liver on a chip that I'm gonna show you. And so the question is, if we take patient iPS cells, so this would be your genetically identical cells, and can create a liver on a chip, can we then put drugs on top of that, you know, various kinds of that, and ask the question, how does that drug affect your own genetically identical liver? That might be different than, you know, than your friends or somebody else's, okay? Or how can we, can we take even, you know, five drugs or 10 drugs, put them together, how are they gonna affect your genetically identical liver? which is something that, you know, the, the pharmaceutical company is just not going to do that for every person. But, you know, uh, or, you know, or the correlation, I mean, one of the other things is how is a random mouse or rat correlated with the behavior that you're going to see in your own liver? So I think it would be much better to actually test it on something that's, you know, genetically identical to. Okay, so it's for drug development, and then I think for organ transplantation, can we ultimately create, you know, liver on a chip that we can actually use for transplantation? And so the idea is to create, you know, how do we program a liver on a chip? Actually, one of the things we try to do is beta cell differentiation. And so the idea is to create a multi-step genetic program where we're trying to uh, mimic embryogenesis. So basically, we said, you know, let's start with iPS cells or stem cells and try to make, make them mimic what happens in embryogenesis by thinking about this as a multi-step genetic program. So like with if-then operations. So if we tell the thing to get started, then make endoderm. If uh, the cell is endoderm, and that's something that the genetic circuit would figure out, then push it towards islet cells, and then push it towards beta cells. 
Okay, so that's the, that's the genetic program, and we can use things like the, that HeLa classifier to have the circuit recognize what step of the differentiation process it is. Okay, so that was the idea, and we said, okay, let's start by making endoderm, so this program, so if small molecule input become endoderm, otherwise don't do anything, remain pluripotent, and actually then become ectoderm. So we put this uh, relatively simple circuit um, that makes the drives towards endoderm state with GATA6, we induce GATA6 in the cells, and then from day zero, we don't, you know, there's not much, so, so the, there's basically no patterning, anything like that over here. So blue represents where the circuit is, uh, and then red represents, we, we also put un, undifferentiated cells, non-programmed cells in there just to mix it up. And then we see in day five, we get basically the emergence of patterns from, from the expression of GATA6. Okay, so the, the cells, the cells self-assemble into patterns. And then we ask, what are those patterns? So there's some kind of symmetry breaking that's taking place here. And those patterns turn out to be uh, where you have high GATA6, they end up becoming endoderm. Where you have low GATA6, they remain pluripotent. And where you have medium GATA6, it depends on their neighbors. Okay, so this is not, this is a decision that is both cell autonomous if you have high or low levels of GATA6, and if you have something in the middle, then you basically succumb to peer pressure, and then you become like what your, you know, what your neighbors are. And so, when, so uh, what happens is day zero, day one, two, three, and day three, we're starting to see endoderm and mesoderm emerge, okay? And then from the mesoderm, we see vasculature, day seven, day turn, endoderm, we see uh, uh, liver, so hepatocytes, and we begin, begin to see liver function as well. Okay, so we have that initial symmetry breaking, and then from that initial symmetry breaking, we begin to see specialization. Okay, and 14 days into it, we're seeing re you know, things that look more interesting and more vasculature. And it has actually beginning to have the vasculature develop on top of a layer of, of hepatocytes and other liver cells. Okay. One thing that we saw in the vasculature we were really excited about and, and was these hematopoietic progenitors. So it turns out that, and we were surprised by this, so these are uh, progenitors for blood, blood cells, and it turns out the liver is actually the second organ during embryogenesis that is actually responsible for making these hematopoietic progenitors. So this is actually not surprising to anybody who understands embryogenesis. It was just surprising to us. Uh, and then we took those and we're able to mature them to actually to what appear to be adult blood cells. So out of a kind of a byproduct of this, we might be able to take your IPS cells, your sk you know, fi skin cells, and then make a liver on a chip and then harvest the blood cells from that. And then may maybe solve the blood supply as a kind of, again, not, don't quote me on that. I don't know if this is videotaped. <laughs> so don't quote me on it. It is? Okay, so just edit that. <laughs> So we didn't cure cancer or the blood supply problems yet. <laughs> okay, and then uh, next to the uh, endoderm, we're also seeing, so the, these not pluripotent cells end up becoming ectoderm. And from the ectoderm, we're seeing the formation of these brain buds. And so what happens is the ectoderm ends up differentiating into telencephalon, which is forebrain. And so if you look under a microscope, you basically have this 2D layer, and you have these brain buds that actually emerge from the 2D layer. And this is, by the way, we got these cells from George Church. So for those of you who know George Church, you would expect these brain buds to be pretty um, you know, intelligent, although we haven't done the IQ test on them yet. But um, so, so anyways, we're getting, uh, and, and by the way, these brain buds have you know, properties that, that uh, are affiliated with neuronal progenitors and telencephalon. And so, basically, in our system, we are starting with a uh, population that has heterogeneous, it's an initial iPS population, heterogeneous GATA6 expression. We get from them endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. So we get all germ layers, all three germ layers from that, which I think is, is new. The only uh, way to do that right now is with embryo bodies, and that's a mess. But we have perfect control over how much endoderm, mesoderm versus ectoderm we get by modulating DOCS levels. And then from that, we get 
all the cell types that are known to exist in the liver bud. Okay? And so uh, to wrap it up, uh, what we do is we start with the foundational work. How can we build DNA quickly and integrate that? We think about systems level engineering, design, how do you worry about you know, insulation, modularity, and so on. So to a large extent, I would say this is the core of synthetic biology. And then we f look at uh, applications that I think are somehow uniquely changed or the paradigm is shifted due to the ability to write genetic programs. Okay? And so you know, lots of people to thank. I showed uh, pictures uh, for, for most of them. Noah with predictions, uh, Patrick with the, uh, with the organoid stuff. Uh, Deepak worked on the, on the load driver. Uh, let's see, uh, Jen and Leela worked on the cancer stuff and other collaborations uh, when I was at Princeton. Francis Arnold initially uh, worked on bacterial stuff. Jake Beal on the uh, prediction and then Kobe Benenson on the cancer and then uh, funding, obviously. And I, I always end by uh, thanking Tom Knight who was my PhD advisor that got me hooked on synthetic biology. And I've basically been completely hooked ever since and not able to get away because, you know, it's so much fun. And I'll end by thanking you and your patience. Thank you. So uh, there are multiple ways to try to get specificity from your in vivo delivery. Um, and what we're doing, I think, is uh, uh, serves as a complementary way to try to do that. So, so for example, if you have nanoparticles, so we work with people that make nanoparticles. Uh, and so on these nanoparticles, they may have certain tropisms to different cells. Right? And so you can decorate sometimes nanoparticles, but it's not, it's not perfect. And you know, sometimes it will go to the wrong cells, and often, oftentimes it will go to the liver. And so there's a lot of inaccuracies there. Uh, another vehicle that we use is AV. So AV goes many different, it's a very broad tropism. And so we'll use a delivery vehicle like that, nanoparticles or viruses, and then we achieve specificity by having the genetic circuit that interrogates the, the state of the cell by microRNA and then computes, is this the right cell or not? And if the answer is yes, then it allows action. And if the answer is no, then it can completely get rid of the DNA, for example. And so it can self-destruct. Okay. So it's, it's really a combination of the, of the delivery agent and the genetic circuit that come together. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, this remains to be seen. So one of one of the questions, for example, uh, so let's look. Let's think about the cancer in particular. So, can you say that uh, you know melanoma or 41 breast cancer has has a unique profile or or you know standard profile? So uh, there's actually two components to that to that answer. So first of all, the profile will change. Absolutely. So as, you know, as the cancer develops and uh, is, becomes heterogeneous, it will change. But then I'm not asking to uh, whether the, the entire profile changes. I'm asking, first question is, is there um, a core that does not change? So if I can find a core that does not change, then I write one genetic classifier that senses that particular core. And so I, I think that core can be highly specific. Now the other cool thing about this approach is if I realize that even the core changes a little bit and I, and I look through the stages of the cancer, what you do is you basically figure out what is the profile for the, you know, for the first stage, the second stage, the third stage, and so on, and then you can write an OR gate. So you can say if the profile is this or this or this or this, then it's going to be, you know, 41 breast cancer in one of the four different stages.
Yeah, so the OR operation that we actually published on uh, going back to 2007 with Kobe Benenson, the OR operation allows you to have, you know, to increase the specificity, meaning to increase the number of cells, and the AND gate allows you to focus in more. So, the, so with the AND gate and the OR gate, we can, I, I believe, uh, address essentially every cell type in, in the body. Um, so with respect to comparing synthetic biology to evolution, so I'll be uh, non-objective and say synthetic biology is better, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the cool things about synthetic biology is that you can make intermediate versions of the, of the system that are really not very fit, right? So I can make intermediate versions and look at them and see, oh, there, this is, has low fitness, this has low fitness, and this this has low fitness, and then basically say, uh, you know, I learned a lot by making these low fitness versions, and that allows me to then create something that has, you know, high fitness. And so, so with respect to, to requiring, in evolution, you're essentially required to always make an, in, you know, a version that has high fitness within that context. And I think in synthetic biology, you can leapfrog that, and, and you can make you know, things that have significant transformations that don't have to go through intermediate steps that are required by evolution to, to get to where you want. Now, evolution obviously uses many different tricks. I don't know, uses is the right word, but evolution, you know, so you can have point mutations or you can have major gene insertions and gene deletions and, and modules. So, so, you know, and gene shuffling. So there are many different, you know, biological mechanisms in evolution that allow you to, to make relatively significant changes, right? Uh, and actually, um, you know, some people believe that evolution has also um, uh, figured out that modularity in certain cases, even though it's not optimal for that particular version, that modularity allows you to have, you know, the ability to adapt better in evolution over time. So while not being perfect for that version, the modularity allows you to, to make, you know, new versions in the future that would uh, then mutate and, and, and give you fitness over time. And so, you know, so maybe there actually is modularity much more in biology than you would expect, even though it's not fully optimal because of the need to, to evolve over time. So. Uh, you didn't mention anything about safety or security. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so safety and security are very important topics. I mean, they're, they're uh, topics that are certainly discussed at, at, at great length. There's one aspect, I think, of safety that synthetic biology actually improves upon, which is the fact that, um, and, and we've developed this, this is uh, things like safety switches and kill switches, meaning that you can deliver, uh, let's say, gene therapy into, into humans and uh, if you realize that something is wrong, something is going wrong, then we have mechanisms right now where you can take, um, and we've demonstrated this in the lab, uh, FDA approved small molecules that interact with the genetic circuit and activate a self-destruct mechanism. So, so and that's something we can add to the system. You know, so for example, if you take a particular small molecule drug and it has some bad side effects on you, what do you do about it? It's, you know, it's very difficult to, to counteract that. Maybe I know, wash it away or something, or put antagonist or something, but it's hard. But we have a mechanism where we can shut off the system at will. Okay, so, so from that level of safety, uh, I think that um, synthetic biology has, has really nice tools to, to make things possibly even more safe. I, th I think that the, you know, the other uh, aspect that you mentioned uh, with GMOs and, and so on. So what happens when you introduce new genes into, an, you know, into, into food? What, what are the implications of that? And that's a very serious issue, and I think that I'm actually more on the side of we need to be more cautious. 
than, than some, you know, many other people. And I think that we do have to um, understand, you know, do a lot more quality assurance and understand that, you know, you're not introducing any kind of uh, potential allergies or, you know, anything like that. And so, so I think that there, we have to go through a more rigorous process of testing, particularly with GMOs, than, than is possibly being done right now. Um, and again, I think for, for certain aspects of, of uh, g going back to the gene therapy, I think for certain aspects of gene therapy, there are situations where even if you don't have perfect prediction, uh, either the use of safety switches or, or if it's terminal cancer, you know, you're willing, to, it's about how much risk are, we, are you willing to take? And I think in certain situations, you're willing to take a lot of risk. And in other situations where you're introducing uh, these gene therapies in, into healthy people, I think that you have to uh, you be a, a lot more careful and cautious and, and do a lot more you know, regulation and control before you're able to introduce this uh, into an actual patient. Thank you.